Good evening. Hi, my name is Wally Verdorn. I'm the Director of Development here at the Oriental Institute. Welcome to another monthly members lecture here at the Oriental Institute. We also want to welcome all those who are joining us online via live streaming. So greetings to our virtual fans of the ancient Middle Eastern studies, wherever you may be around the world. Uh, tonight's lecture is also particularly special because our speaker is the annual Braidwood Visiting Scholar at the OI. Uh, as many of you know, this annual Visiting Scholar Program was created through the generous support of family members and friends to honor Robert and Linda Braidwood, two prolific, even legendary OI archaeologists, who you will be hearing a bit more about in just a few minutes. Um, I also want to extend my personal greetings and thanks to Gradle Braidwood, who is here with us tonight. Uh, Gradle is Robert and Linda's daughter, who truly grew up at the Oriental Institute and at archaeological expeditions across the Near East that were led by her parents. Uh, if you haven't met Gradle yet, I hope you do, because I have to tell you, she has stories. Uh, and in fact, um, Gradle would like to say just a few words to us, and so I'd like to welcome her up to, this, to the podium. Wally's right when he talks about growing up here at the Institute. I did part when we weren't out in the field, and I, for any of you who are docents or have been docents, I will be one of the people you would have slapped because I was able to uh, pat the nose of the bull in the Persian Hall as a child and various other things which are simply verboten now. Um, I've talked about how the program was created before, and so I'm not going to go there particularly. But because we're in the centennial year, I want to tell you a little bit about how my parents fit into this 100-year time frame. Uh, Bob and Linda died 16 years ago, and they kept their old passports, and I have them in a drawer. And I used the passports last week to get my numbers straight. They were Oriental Institute archaeologists for many years. My dad first went to the field for the OI in 1933. 86 years ago, and they wed as a team the year that they were married in 1937, which is 82 years ago. Those early years were in the Amuk. Later, they worked in Iraq, Iran, and from 1964 on in eastern Turkey. In 1994, after 61 years in the field for my dad and almost as many for my mother, they made their last field trip to Turkey for the Institute. After their death in 2003, and using gifts that were made in their memory, we created the program. And it, it, this program, all of us who are hearing Ian Hodder tonight are getting a special treat because the program was actually created for the Institute students, and there have been workshops for a couple of days. But fortunately, the, uh, the visiting scholars are always willing to give a member's lecture as well. So Chris. Before we move on, I also want, of course, to express my thanks to all the OI members who are here with us tonight, both in person as well as online. Uh, the annual and ongoing support from our members makes possible programs like our monthly lecture series and also provides resources to the pioneering research and discovery that is still being led by so many OI faculty and researchers. Um, if you're not a member yet, consider joining and supporting all the scholarly adventures at the OI. And so let's get our lecture program started. And I now have the pleasure of introducing Christopher Woods, the John A. Wilson Professor and the Director of the Oriental Institute. Thank you, Wally, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to this year, our Centennial Year's Braidwood Lecture. I would like to begin by uh, thanking Gretel Braidwood and Ray Tyndall 
um, for their wonderful support of the Braidwood Visiting Scholar Program, which began, uh, as you heard, in 2003 and now is an annual event. Uh, the Braidwoods, in many ways, are the first family of the Oriental Institute. They're part of the very fabric of this place. Gretel, as you heard, virtually grew up at the OI and was a regular presence on OI excavations in Iraq and Turkey, led by her parents, Bob and Linda. And she worked here 30 years at the university as a development officer, including a period here at the OI. Ray, her husband, is an OI institution in his own right. He worked at the OI for 32 years and was registrar and senior curator when he retired in 2007. Now, Bob Raidwood, whose memory and accomplishments we honor with these lectures, also spent his entire academic career here at the OI, having been hired first by James Henry Breasted himself, the founder of the OI in 1933. And throughout Bob's astounding career, he worked in close partnership with his wife, Linda, who, like Bob, did her graduate work here at Chicago. Um, there isn't time tonight to do anything approaching justice to Bob Raidwood's career. I would simply note that more than any other scholar, Bob Raidwood shaped the modern scientific and multidisciplinary study of archaeology as a discipline. He pioneered the methods of landscape archaeology and was a leading light in understanding the absolutely critical, but at that time still neglected, phase of the human career that saw the transition from nomadic hunting and gathering to domestication, which set the stage for civilization. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Bob Raidwood is often considered an inspiration behind Indiana Jones. It is now my honor to introduce this year's Braidwood Visiting Scholar and one of the true giants of archaeology today, Professor Ian Hodder. Professor Hodder was trained at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, and at Cambridge University, where he obtained his PhD in 1975. After a brief period teaching at Leeds, he returned to Cambridge, where he taught until 1999. During that time, he became professor of archaeology and was elected a fellow of the British Academy. In 1999, he joined the faculty at Stanford University and as the Dunlevy family professor in the Department of Anthropology and as director of the Stanford Archaeology Center. Professor Hodder's main large-scale excavation projects have been at Haddenham in the east of England and, of course, at Çatalhöyük in Turkey, where he worked from 1993 to 2018. Professor Hodder has received a truly astounding number of important international awards and prizes. To name just a few, he's been awarded the Oscar Montilius Medal of the Swedish Society of Antiquaries, the Huxley Memorial Medal by the Royal Anthropological Institute, the Fiesen International Prize, the Gold Medal by the Archaeological Institute of America, and has honorary doctorate, doctorates from both Bristol and Leiden universities. In 2019, he was appointed a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in the Queen's Honor List. Professor Hodder's main books include Spatial Analysis in Archaeology, 1976, Symbols in Action, 1982, Reading the Past, 1986, the Domestication of Europe, 1990, The Archaeological Process, 1999, The Leopard's Tale, Revealing the Mysteries of Chatelhuyuk, 2006, and, the, and, the, and Entangled in Archaeology of the Relationships Between Humans and Things, 2012, among, incredibly, other monographs. Additionally, there are literally hundreds of articles to his credit. Tonight, Professor Hutter will describe his 25 spectacular years excavating at Chatelhuyuk. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our Braidwood visiting scholar, Professor Ian Hutter. Thank 
you very much for that overly generous um, in introduction. And I'm very grateful to the OI for inviting me uh, to give the Braidwood Lecture. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So thank you very much. Um, I have put this first uh, slide up partly because I wanted to uh, thank uh, the people who have been involved in the Chattahoo project for 25 years. Uh, and much of what I say, or all of what I'll say tonight, is, is really a product of, of the joint work of a large team. But I've also put it up because uh, I, I wanted to say how pleased I am to give uh, a, le a lecture in honor, in honor of uh, uh, Braidwood. Um, because in, in many ways, I, I see the work that we did at Chattel as a, as a sort of modern development and extension of, of the sorts of approaches that Robert and Linda, Linda Braidwood uh, pioneered uh, in the 30s onwards. And in particular, the way that they pioneered the importance of bringing in lots of different specialists, uh, sci natural scientists, uh, to, to, to work alongside archaeologists, to, to build a picture through a collaborative process. And I like to think if, if they were here tonight, uh, they, they would see really the development of their work into the modern era, where we have about 34. I mean, when the Braidwoods were working, they, they, they talk about having four or five natural scientists of various sorts, a zooarchaeologist and a paleobotanist and a soil person and so on. We now have 34 different types of scientific specialists that we work with us. And, and, and so um, I hope very much that the work I'll talk to you about today is in the spirit of the sort of uh, approaches that they championed. So I um, want to start by just telling you a little bit very briefly about Chattelhuyuk, and then I'm going to go just into a series of specific questions and issues um, that um, I, I'll talk about. So I've discovered this great new technology with my thing here so, so, that, so that I can sh show you things in detail. Um, so I'm going to play with this all night because it's really wonderful. So, so, so this is the East Mound at Chattelhuyuk. Uh, where the main Neolithic sequence is uh, that was discovered by James Mellon in the 50s and 60s. And uh, we, we worked here in this northern, under this northern shelter. And you can see there's a sort of northern mound here. And you can see a slight rise here, a northern mound. And then there's a southern area here, this whole area here, southern area, where Mellon excavated. These are his trenches and where we continue excavating. So there's this east mound, and there's also a later west mound that I'm not going to be talking about. If, if we uh, look into um, these, these two shelters, in the north shelter, this is what we're looking at. And what we're trying to do here is understand the way that the site was organized at one moment in time. And I'll come back to the houses that we found here in this northern area. And in the southern area, uh, we have a slightly different focus, which is to look at the development of the site through time and the, the changes in material culture and the social organization that we see through the sequence. And th this gives you an idea of what that sequence uh, looks like, um, where, where we start uh, at the base down here, where we're clearly outside the settlement. This is refuse. The, ma the main settlement is somewhere over here. And this is at about 7,100 BC, 7,100 BC, right at the bottom here. And then there are a series of um, houses. You can see the walls of the houses being built up over time uh, through this area. And then around 6,500, there's a sort of hiatus. And uh, there are, again, houses at the top but they're, 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 there is less of an organized pattern of house built on house over time. So basically, in the northern area, uh, we've been focusing on how the, the society is organized at one moment in time. And in the southern area, we're looking at change through time. And there's obviously many, many different things that I could focus on in talking about. And, but what I've decided to do is just concentrate on five uh, themes that give you an... That, so I can show you some of the ways in which our methods 
have led to new interpretations of this uh, Neolithic uh, site. So we'll look at the landscape and the environment, look at the, how big the site was, uh, look at questions of social organization, hierarchy, and other types of social organization. And then I'll talk sort of fairly briefly about change through time in the sequence uh, towards the end. So in terms of uh, landscape and environment, one, one of the interesting things uh, about working with a team over 25 years uh, is that new members join the team and the, the team changes. And as the team changes, what one tends to find is that the new, the new members of the team want to overturn the ideas of the previous members of the team. So, so there's always a transformation. And this happened very, has happened very much with landscape and environment. So the original work that was done uh, trying to reconstruct what the landscape around Chattahoyuk was like argued that the site was located in a large flat plain that was originally a Pleistocene lake that then dried up and then there were alluvial deposits that were brought into this flat uh, uh, Pleistocene uh, zone and that the, this alluvial material was very attractive to early agriculture and a series of sites were attracted and the biggest of these alluvial fans in the, in the Konya Plain is where Chattelhuyuk is located. But the river that created that alluvium also kept bringing down water and the argument was that by uh, coring through the land around Chattelhuyuk there seemed to be a lot of very wet type of deposits, a sort of back swamp clay and it was argued that, in fact, Chattelhuyu was located in a wetland that was seasonally flooded, and extremely badly flooded, so that it was impossible for fields to be right by the site. Now, we know from the, the seeds and the, plant and the animal bones on the site that this is a fully agricultural uh, settlement. Um, and so it, it became really problematic to argue that the, the land around the site was very wet. In fact, the, the, these early paleoenvironmentalists uh, in, in my project argued that the fields must have been about 12 kilometers away, that people were going quite a long distance in order to get to the fields. So when a new group of paleoenvironmentalists arrived, they didn't like this idea of, of going, over, you know, going long distances to the fields. And so they decided to re-look at the data, and uh, they did a whole series of, some, of new coring around the site. And so you can see up here uh, that here's the east mound and the west mound. And these are the cores that they, they, they were digging all the way around through the alluvium down into the Pleistocene Marl in order to get a sequence of, uh, of environmental change through time. And what they found was, was that in fact the original Pleistocene Marl was very undulating, very, with lots of hills and hummocks. It wasn't flat at all in the end and that there was lots of evidence of these small channels that were going through this landscape. And so they ended up saying that what really we had was some sort of deltaic type of um, pattern as you can see in these reconstructions. And so for them, they argue that in the late Pleistocene you, you have this one river going through this landscape and then through time this, this, this river starts branching. But by the time of Chattelhuyuk, the East Mound, you have a, a very complex dendritic system of, of small channels that were not producing large amounts of water in great sheets but were leaving dry hillocks uh, between the little channels. So it was a mosaic of, of wetland and dry, dry hummocks creating a very diverse, very rich landscape with lots of different types of uh, um, resources from everything from fish and snails and so on uh, through to um, good grazing for animals and, and for cereals. And then in the period after the, um, the East Mound, uh, when the West Mound is constructed, you get a continuation of this sort of very dendritic pattern. So, so this is how we now see the, the landscape of Chattelhuyu uh, as, as a rich mosaic of, 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 of a great variety of different types of uh, environment that could be exploited and also of different types of clay because you've got this Pleistocene marl and you've got this alluvium coming down and Chattelhuyuk is really built of clay, all, all of everything there really, there's very little stone in this area 
So everything is made of mud, of mud, uh, mud dried mud brick houses and ceramic pottery and, and so on. Uh, it's a very extensive dependence on clay. So in a way you can also see there the importance of having a long-term project. If we had just stopped after 10 years, we would have had the wrong answers. And so going on and do, developing over time is important. The second thing I want to, to talk about is um, population es estimates. The, the, the East Mound is, is itself quite uh, large. It's about 13 hectares. But it's very difficult to know what that means in terms of population size. At, at, these sort, at these types of sites in this type of, peer, in this type of period, people would have tended to argue that the population sizes must have been quite small. However, when we, we started uh, working out what we thought was the, the number of people who could live on the East Mound, um, we, we got figures between uh, 3,500 and 8,000. And this was work that someone called Craig Sesford did in 2005. Now there are a series of sites in the seventh millennium in the, in the Middle East that are known as mega sites that, that do indeed seem to be very large. But there are other people who argue that this can't really be possible. The, the, these are societies which do have agriculture but it's not, it's not extremely intensive agriculture. And they seem to be relatively egalitarian, in other words not to have centralized elites of some sort, and we'll come back to that later. But if you've got a fairly egalitarian society with relatively small-scale agriculture where they're still hunting and uh, gathering to a large degree, uh, how is it possible to have as much as 3,500 or 8,000 people living together without violence and conflict and, and so on? And so other people like these, these guys here have argued recently that this must be a massive overestimation because of something called scalar stress. So what they're saying is that you simply can't have that number of people together without some sort of centralized organization, some leaders, some chiefs, some central bureaucracy. Otherwise you get too much stress and things get out of control and there's too much violence. So they're saying in fact that the numbers must be wildly wrong and we must be talking really about a few hundred or maybe a thousand uh, people. So what I want to do is to point out to you that, that it's actually extremely difficult to work out how many people were living at Chattelhuyuk at any one time. You've seen that we've only excavated in two areas, in the northern area and the southern area. What, what about the whole of the rest of the man? Well, we have done a lot of surface pickup, you know, sort of collecting stuff from the surface of the man and also doing scrapes at intervals across the man in order to find out what the latest occupation looked like. But both of those methods are only telling you the latest occupation. They're not telling you about what's going on farther down. One of the things that one can try and use is ground penetrating radar, which looks down into the ground. But Chattelhuyuk is 21 meters high, and this type of technique can only go down something like three, three or four meters. But nevertheless, it does, it does give us something more than just um, surface collection. And what this showed was uh, an interesting pattern in the, around the northern shelter. So this here is the, that sort of shape in the middle is an area I'll show you soon, is where we've been excavating in the north shelter. But all around it, we have these traces of walls that seem to be on a north-south or west-east alignment. And all the buildings in here have that same alignment. So we think that these are traces of Neolithic houses that, um, that extended ar around the excavated area. When, when we get to the skirts of the mound uh, uh, up here, the, the, um, the overburden of eroded soil is such, so, so much that we can't see through it. But as far as we've been able to show with ground penetrating radar, it does seem that what we have at Chatal Huyu is a dense occupation over the whole site. And we don't see anything different. We don't see a big plazas or big uh, administrative centers or big temples or anything like that. As far as we can interpret from this, uh, we, we're just looking at lots and lots of houses all, all packed together. 
so I've now gone into that northern area that was in the middle of that and we're looking at this is the area where we've been excavating and you can see on the whole that uh, despite some change in angle here that most of the houses are on the same sort of north south west east alignment which seems to be true of the, of the whole site so you would have thought that we can just take a plan like this of the houses at Chattelhuyuk and then make some assumption about how many people lived in the houses and then multiply that and get a population estimate and that's the sort of approach that Craig Sesford used but there are a lot of assumptions in that we, we, this is how the site looks when we take off the topsoil and start excavating these are the buildings that we see but can we be sure that each of these buildings is really contemporary when I showed you the section earlier on uh, I showed how you have these houses that are building up in these long columns a house built on top of a house built on top of a house so, you, so what Chattel here consists of a, a lot of the time is these columns of houses that are rebuilt on top of each other and then next door there's another column of houses and then another column of houses and they don't necessarily interact very much or intersect so there's very little stratigraphical key that allows you to say exactly whether these houses are really contemporary and so the, so the way that we've been trying to explore this issue is by using uh, radiocarbon dating uh, allied with uh, Bayesian statistics and, and so what, the, what we've been uh, we have about 600 dates from the ex new excavations at Chattelhuyu and in this area there's about 160 dates uh, and what we're trying to do is to use uh, these, these new dating methods to get very precise um, ideas of how long each house was lived in and which houses were contemporary what, what this method does is it links the radiocarbon dating with our prior information about the stratigraphical relationships that we do have and so what I'm going to show you now this is work done by Alex Bayliss and Boju Tung is to give you a sense of what the settlement pattern in the north area looked like uh, so in, in, this, in this area here in 25 year uh, sections so, so we're going back to 6650 so BC to um, in, in 25 year blocks to 6400 BC so what, what, the, what this is doing is saying that in a 25 year plan, uh, um, segment of time we know which buildings have the highest probability of being occupied during that period based on the radiocarbon dates and and so what this is showing here is that in this in this earliest phase there are a series of buildings but there, are, there is also a, an, a large area of midden or open area which is shown, shown here so th this is this open area and then there's a series of buildings that were uh, built in, in re next to it if we go to the next 25 year phase we see that that's changing and that, and that the, there's, there's less there's more midden or open area or refuse areas between the houses there's less of that and more buildings and then that shifts again uh, and then towards the later part we begin to get something else that emerges which is uh, houses that are left abandoned so that they are, are sort of vacant lots so at this point you have houses that are lived in you have open areas where open activities and refuse deposition is going on and then you have these vacant lots these are buildings that are just left and, and as you go on through time uh, you find that that uh, changes so that by the end of the occupation there are quite a lot of vacant lots I've only, I've only just um, I only got this stuff yesterday uh, and so I'm, I have, I'm sort of want to play with it a bit uh, so if you, if you go through it quickly it's like you, you, you see sorry I'm going too fast um, oh dear what have I done here we go um, 
So we're going back through time now. But, it, but, it's, but you, you see these trends um, that initially you've got a lot of open space and then that gets broken down and then you start to get lots, empty lots until you end up with um, a lot of empty lots and then the area gets abandoned. So I just, I'm just enjoying doing this, so I'm going to keep doing it, sorry. Um, it's, it's like you're getting a 25-year movie. This is, this is very unusual for the sites of this early to be able to do this, which is why I'm excited by it, to, to be able to sort of see these sort of changes through time. And, 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 and the changes that you see, particularly the, the shift from a lot of open space to less open space, and then the shift to vacant lots is something that we find elsewhere on the site. So it's a real pattern that one can talk about. So I'll just go through it again. So anyway, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's clear then that working out the population size is, is it, you would get different results as you go through time. Uh, and uh, so it becomes relatively meaningless to try and work out what the population is. The, the, we, we of course, we're only looking at a short, small window. We don't really know what's happening in the whole of the rest of the Chattahoyuk, although, as I said, we do have similar sequences in the south. But um, what we can do is say that if we go back through time to the, play, the time when the, there is most least vacant lots and most use of space, we can take these sorts of moments in time and work out what is the maximum type of po maximum population if the whole of the site was like this. And if we do that, we, we do get numbers that are, it's impossible to bring them down to sort of 1,000 or a few hundred. If, if, you, if you take this particular map and, and generalize for the rest of the site, you, you get numbers again around 5,500. So it's very difficult to see unless there's something very different going on somewhere that we don't know about. It's very difficult to see how we can get the population down to very, very markedly. So it seems to me that Craig Sesford was right when he had those initial, initial estimates. But the important point is that it changes a lot through time. And just as an archaeological point, it, it just shows that when you, when you see these sorts of maps of houses in, on a site, you know, it's really important to, to be suspicious about whether they're really or contemporary or not. So if it is the case then that we have a lot of people living very tightly packed together in, in this sort of way as at Chattahuyuk, so tightly packed together that there are not streets so that people are moving around on the surface of the mound, so on the surface of the houses, on the roofs of the houses, going down on, from the roofs into, into these small buildings. If you've got this very tightly packed uh, system, um, why is it that you don't have total chaos if, if you don't have strong leadership? And um, one of the ways that we've been exploring this is to look at whether we do have, in fact, evidence of violence uh, on the skeletal remains. So people were buried beneath the floors of the houses at Chattahuyu. When we excavate them, do we find lots of evidence of violence? Well, w one of the things that we don't find is arrowheads or spearheads stuck in bodies. We don't find clear evidence of parry fractures on arms and so on. So that we don't find a lot of evidence of people, in fact, I don't think there's any evidence of any person who died as a result of those sorts of wounds at Chattahuyuk. So there is no, there is no, in many archeologists find on other sites, things like arrowheads stuck in spines and so on. We, we just haven't got that. The, 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 the early people who, who worked on the hum, human remains at Chattahoo, the early part of my project there, they argued that there was no evidence of violence at Chattahoo. But again, when a new set of human remains people came along, they didn't like that idea. They, they said, well, we're going to prove this is wrong. And so they looked back at all the evidence, and they came up with evidence of violence. And this is the main type of evidence they found, which is a blunt force trauma on the skull. So there's lots of evidence of bashing the skull, particularly in the position that you can see on the, on the right there. But it's important to recognize that none of this led to death. Th th this is a type of injury that people continued living with. And, and so 
it's also difficult to interpret exactly what caused this. But one, I, one idea is that it's a sort of ritualized violence, some sort of um, ritual fighting of some sort uh, that led to these types of wounds. We, we can't really say that, of course. But, um, but in a way, this type of evidence suggests even more that there is a, a, an interesting question, which is how do you organize a society so that you don't have violence that leads to death? The violence is somehow controlled in, in some way or other. So are there, in fact, elites or ritual leaders or some sort of chiefs of some sort at Chattelhuyuk that could have somehow managed all the, this large population without having a large amount of violence? And I'm going to talk about hierarchy then and something that we call the history house. <clears throat> so I've talked about how at Chattelhuyuk you have these columns of houses. People live in one house. Uh, they then, uh, after 30 or 100 years, somewhere between that, they, they knock down the upper part of the house, they fill in the lower part of the house, and then they build another house on top of the walls of the previous house, and then they carry on doing that, sometimes in long columns of, of houses. And it's these buildings that we've started, or I've started to call history houses. But it's a slightly more complicated definition than that. It's not the case that all houses are like this. Some houses are built out onto midden, some houses are abandoned and they become midden or refuse areas, but some houses continue through time. So the question is, why do some houses do this and some houses uh, not? And it's these, these houses that continue over a long period of time that tend to be also the ones that have most elaborate symbolism in them. So, for example, um, in, in this house here, uh, we have, these are the walls of the house, and then this is a platform with a bull's horns placed around the platform. This is a small bull's head here, and the, the was, there was painting and so on uh, also around this platform. Or here's another example where you've got a bench with lots of bull's horns and a big bull's uh, head uh, put, placed in a niche uh, in the wall. Uh, the, these, these sorts of things are very reminiscent of what Mellart called shrines. So he also found these more elaborate buildings which he thought were shrines and that they were not domestic houses. But what we're sure of is that all houses at Chattelhuyuk have domestic activity and they're all domestic houses but some of them have more of this ritual stuff in than others. And beneath the floors of the houses, you have large numbers of burials. So you can have up to 62 people buried beneath the floor of the house. This suggests that people are being buried into the house from other houses, uh, as if, as if um, these more elaborate houses with long continuity uh, attracted burial from other houses. So, we can show this in various graphs. This is a graph that tries to show uh, the number of houses built on top of each other on, on, the, on the horizontal axis. So whether it's two, four, six, or eight houses built on top of each other. And then it's looking at the number of burials. And you see that the, the more houses you have on top of each other, the more likely you are to have a lot of burials in, in the houses. So that, that suggests that there's something distinctive about these houses that have repeatedly rebuilt in the same location. Or here's another example of a, a relationship uh, between um, the number of burials, number of individuals buried, and the elaboration index, which means, which is an index of how many bull's horns and other installations and sculptures there are in the house. So this is, you see there's a positive relation there, which suggests in the completely excavated buildings that the more elaborate buildings have more people buried in them. So what we're, find, what we're finding then is that there are these houses that are built over a long period of time, completely often rebuilt in the same place, that have more ritual in them and they have more burials. So you might have thought, aha, these are your elites, these are the chiefs, these are the, these are the people who are organizing and controlling society. The trouble is, that we can't find anything that correlates with this. So 
For example, here we're looking at um, the elaboration index again, which is this measure of how elaborate a, a building is in terms of bull's horns and things. And this is the percentage of the, of the house that is used for storage and production. And you see there isn't any relationship. It's not the case that the more elaborate buildings, the ones with the more burials, also have more storage and more, and more space for production. And we find this over and over again. Every, every, everything we look at uh, d doesn't show a relationship. So it's not the case that these more elaborate buildings control production, uh, that they have more evidence of um, uh, sort of stone tool production, for example, or grinding production, or, 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 any, or, or richer artifacts. So th 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 this seems to be a type of society where there were uh, religious r elites that, that in somehow controlled burial and history, but they were not able to translate that type of control, that type of ritual and social control, into the control of production. So these are not elites in a sort of a more typical uh, sense. But again, I want, I want to emphasize how difficult it is to make these types of argument. And I, I've sort of blithely put up these charts as if these points are all contemporary, or that each house could, can be talked about in some aggregate way. <clears throat> What we've actually found at Chattelhoyu is that houses go through very, very complex histories. <clears throat> so this is a, an example of work done by Wendy Matthews and Aroa Garcia. And what we're looking at here is the plaster on the walls of the houses. And you can see that, I don't know how well you can see, but for example, here you have lots and lots of layers of plaster on the walls, and very, very fine, thin layers here. So sometimes you can have up to, up to 250 layers of plaster on the wall, where people have been re-plastering it, and sometimes it's very fine plaster. We think they've been doing this almost monthly, sort of monthly re-washing, re putting new plaster whitewash on the wall. And so that means that, it ch that we have an amazing record of of the history of what's going on in a house. So for example, up here, um, look, at, look at all these layers of plaster that have been put on. This is some ridge on the wall. Look how you can, each of these is a very fine, a sort of foundation layer and a fine layer of white plaster. And you can follow through here and look at these very fine layers. So you're looking at month after month, year after year, uh, as I said, sometimes hundreds and hundreds of these layers that you can follow through time. And here's another sequence here, and then you can look more closely here, expand that, and you see that you've got sort of painting. Uh, so some of these layers of plaster are painted. So th this gives you the opportunity to, to look, well, uh, at one level it's a real headache, because how do you dig this archaeologically? I mean, it, it, this is why it can take up to nine years to dig a house at Chattelhuyu because you're trying to take these layers off very, very carefully and follow these sequences of activity on the walls and on the floors. This is a, another way of looking at the same thing, in this case on the floors. So th this is a particular house here, and uh, we're taking a section through the floors here, from the southern dirty floors, that we call them, to the northern clean floors. So here are the southern dirty floors. They're going over this bench here, going over the bench, then along here into the northern part of the site. And it's always in the northern part of the house that you get burials. And so you get these burials cut from some of these floors, but not from all of them. And so when I was sort of saying, OK, well, we've got so many people buried in this house and, and so much elaboration in the house, that's all really undermined by the fact that these houses go through these complex histories and sometimes there are burials and sometimes there are not. And someone called Kevin Kay has been um, very interested in trying to understand this type of sequence. And uh, what he's looking here, what he's done here is take a particular building, say building 77, and looks through time 
This isn't dated time, it's just sort of sequences of events through the sequence and is looked at the number of burials and you see that the burials die out in the later part of the occupation of this house whereas uh, various types of painting and sculpture continue on through this later phase. So when I said simply earlier on that you know, there's a correlation between the amount of burials and the amount of elaboration, that's not exactly true. It, it is true if you take the aggregate of the house, but in, in actual any particular moment that may not be true. And so making these arguments about, about social organization and hierarchy and so on but need to take that type of complexity uh, into account. And a final graph on this theme. I, I, I said um, how difficult it was to, to find any evidence of relationships between uh, things like burials and amount of elaboration in the house. But if we do take the aggregate of those things for, every, for, any, for any particular house, I just want to emphasize that we do not find any relationship between the, the number of burials and the amount of lab, elaboration in a house and anything else. So this, this is looking at um, the number of uh, inclusions in graves. So, so we're looking at the percentage of individuals with associations. So in other words, what's, what this person is doing, Milena Vasic, what she's done is looked at the burials in the houses and see which of those have things added into the graves to make them sort of richer graves in some way. And what you might expect to find is that the burials with more grave, with more grave goods and with more stuff in them might be found in the more elaborate houses and the houses with more burials. But we just don't find that. You see there's no trend in this graph. We're not getting, a, we're not getting some sort of relationship for, from the bottom here up to the top there uh, where you get more, you know, richer graves uh, in, in, in the more elaborate burial uh, buildings. So again, this is another indication that the, 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 the houses that were in some sense in control of burial and ritual were not able to translate that type of status uh, into richness, control of trade, control of production, uh, control of storage, and so on. So it's a type of society which I would call egalitarian but within which there were differences based on um, sort of social and ideological uh, considerations. So that still leaves us not really understanding how this very complex, dense set of uh, houses, this dense population was organized. Um, how, how, was daily, how was the daily practices of the economy and so on, of, and food and production, how was all that organized? And so I'm going to try and look into that um, now. And um, one way of doing that is to look at the artifacts that are found in each of these uh, houses, bearing in mind the, the problems I raised earlier uh, about which of these are really contemporary and uh, the changes within the life of any particular house. And so someone who's tried to understand the, the arrangement of the, the social arrangement of the, the settlement using the artifacts and architectural features inside the houses is Camilla Matsukato. And what she has done is code every house in terms of the types of artifact and material culture and architectural arrangement and the paintings and the bull's heads and so on uh, in each house. And she's then drawn lines, if you like, between the houses that are most similar in terms of the things that you have found in them. And then she uses a, a type of analysis, and a network analysis, in, in order to see if there are any groupings. And so what's, what, what, on this diagram, the, um, the circles here are the houses, and these squares are the artifacts that tell you why two houses are put close to each other. So if you've got two houses that are close to each other here, that's because they're very similar in terms of material culture. Okay? It's not because they're close to each other on the site, it's just that they're similar to each other in terms of the, the, the stuff in them. 
and you can't see it, but I, I can see that all of these houses up here, these are all in the southern part of our excavations, in that southern area. Whereas all of these houses here are in the northern part of our, of the ex, uh, in our northern excavation area. So remember that she's not putting any spatial information in here. It's simply that the artifacts have grouped the, grouped the houses into two groups which correlate with our two excavation areas. That suggests that at Chattelhuy there may be two societies, the, the northern mound and the southern mound, doing different things, part of one site, but divided in some way into two subgroups. But it becomes yet more interesting if you, you use the same technique to look more closely. So th this is looking here at the southern area, the, so the so south excavations, and this is at the northern area that we were looking at before. And on these graphs, again, it's the same thing. The, the, how close and how linked these houses are is, is a measure of the similarity in terms of the architecture and internal features and artifacts in these houses. And so if we look here, what you see is that there are four buildings here close to each other, uh, 76, 79, 80, and 89, those four here. If you look at where they are on the graph, they're here, 79, 89, 80, and 76. So again, she didn't put in any spatial information, but it, what this is showing very clearly is that there's a little group of houses down here that are similar to each other. So there's a little neighborhood of closely similar houses. And, and we find the same up, up here, that there is little neighborhoods of houses that, that, are sim that um, cluster together in these diagrams. That suggests that Chattelhuyuk is organized into a set of local neighborhoods, uh, little clusters or groups of houses that are somehow doing similar things together, that are somehow more closely related. But in addition to that, there's something else going on because you have odd houses like this one, 96 here, which is ov over here and is more closely related to these buildings over here. So as well as these little neighborhoods, there are also these offshoots, these strange sort of connections, and I'm going to try and make sense of that. Um, one, of, one, of, one of the ways that we've used the work that Kevin Kay has been doing is to look at the way that, that particular buildings change through time. And we saw this sort of thing before, but this is a sim simplified version. So if we take this building 77, for example, this is looking at, through, through time, through the sequence of use of that particular house, looking at the number of hearths there are and the number of ovens. And so through that sequence, there are a good number of hearths and ovens. But you see this other building here, building 59, has a whole period in which there are no hearths and ovens. And that occurs in a number of other cases where you, you've got gaps in, in either hearths or ovens or in both. So there must have been a way in which this house was somehow producing food during the years. And th this, these gaps and the, la the lack of hearths and ovens in houses is suggesting that people are collaborating in some way, so that people are cooking in one house and sharing food uh, amongst other and, th and this type of uh, evidence um, was also found in the archaeobotanical evidence, which is suggesting that there are local clusters in terms of consumption of particular types of food, but also in the production of food. But so that there seems to be evidence from weed seeds and other types of marker that groups of houses, local neighborhood groups of houses, are, uh, are, are um, uh, producing food from similar fields or adjacent fields in the landscape and, uh, and then bringing it back and consuming that food within these same sorts of clusters. One way we can see that is through using uh, isotopes uh, and uh, we're looking here at the isotopes uh, of the people buried uh, within buildings. So I, I mentioned to you that you can have up to 60... 62 people buried within a house. Most houses have much less in, but we nevertheless think that people are being buried into these houses from other houses. And if we look at the diets of the people buried in these houses, we find that they're clustered. 
So you can see here that if you look at the, the diets in this building, they're rather different from the diets in that building and, and so on and so forth. And if you, it, we've done statistical tests on this and th th this is a significant, there is a, these are significant differences statistically. So this is suggesting that the people who, who, bury, who were buried in a house also ate together. So, so there is some sort of community of groups of, of people who both buried together and ate together. And if we expand that out to look at um, groups of neighborhood groups of houses, we find the same thing. Again, statistical evidence that the diets of clusters of houses have, are, are similar in some sense. So what we can begin to say is that there are uh, neighborhood groupings within uh, Chattelhuyuk and that your membership of a neighborhood group was, was important in terms of um, the way that you built your house, what you put in your house, in terms of how you produce food and how you consumed food and how you buried people. Um, but I also mentioned those strange cases where you have um, long distance connections across the site that don't seem to be neighborhood based. And so this, this is a, an example of a house uh, in Chattelhuyuk. Um, here you have the northern wall uh, and here's the southern wall with an oven and a hearth here in front of it. So you would, you would come down a ladder onto this little platform here uh, rather like going down the chimney in a Father Christmas sort of way. You come down the ladder here onto this platform and then you move northwards onto these white platforms where people are buried. There, there was some burning here when this place was abandoned. But on this wall here, above this platform, um, we found uh, this painting which, which ended up looking like this. And you can see that it's got a series of vertical panels or vertical lines and attached to those are these triangles and in between the triangles there, are this, there is this brick pattern. So you can then say, well, are, are there any other paintings like that at Chattelhuyu? And there are, so you can see up, so this is the one we just looked at. Up here, you see the sim very similar, these vertical lines, the triangles, and the brick pattern. So it's very unlikely that these, these two people weren't aware of each other, these two buildings weren't aware of each other. But they're not next door to each other, they're in fact as far away as you can get uh, in the southern area. So th this, this is, this, this is the, the one, this one here, and there's this one over here. So this is suggesting long-term, I mean long-distance connections that, that cut across the little neighborhood groupings. And if we look at a whole series of things at Chattelhuyuk that are very famous, like the pairs of leopards, which is a very distinctive Chattelhuyuk uh, symbolism, or these, these figures with upraised arms that we think are bears, or these benches with horns. If you plot where they are, you find that they're, they're not clustered. They're, they're not, they don't fit into any of the neighborhood groupings. They're just spread out across the whole site. And it's very tempting to sort of interpret these in terms of um, uh, some sort of society or sodality uh, that, that cut across the neighborhoods. Um, and so the, these might be societies like medicine societies or hunting societies or some sort of, some sort of uh, sodality that links people together across, across the whole settlement. So there's two types of things at Chattelhuyuk. There, there are these local neighborhoods that are, that are nested in, in each other, very small ones into larger ones into the north-south division and into the whole settlement, these nested little entities. Uh, and then cross-cutting that, there are these large-scale um, uh, connections. And burial 
uh, is a very interesting thing because it seems to somehow link these two things uh, together. What, um, so what I've tried to do here is show that some houses like this one here with a, with a big circle have lots of burials in. And this one here has lots of burials in. It's a bit fewer. But there are other houses with no burials in. So this is the idea that people are buried into these houses from somewhere else. So we, we don't know where they were buried f into from. We, we can't say where they came from. But, the, but it's likely, seems likely to me that the most, this type of bur burial into these history houses, that that was on a, on a local scale, that, that, that was probably, given the dietary evidence and so on, it seems likely that the, these, the people buried in the houses were, were, a lo were a part of the local group. But there's something else going on with the burials, which is that there's lots of evidence of secondary removal. So, so you see here a, a torso with the arms and legs missing. Um, and here there are examples where you've got the torso and the head missing. And here there's another body laid out here with the head missing. Here's some more examples. So we find quite a n number of cases where after the burial has occurred, uh, the parts of the body are taken and seem to be kept and handed around for quite some period of time. And so w one example that's quite telling is, is in this case here, where you've got a woman who is buried with a skull that she's clasping, to, clasp, it's another woman, she's clasping the, the other woman's uh, head on towards her, and this face has been, re has been plastered so the, 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 the facial features have been plastered back onto the skull and repainted. But they've been repaint, repainted four times. So that suggests that to, for some degree, uh, the, this skull has been passed around. And there's lots of other examples of painted skulls and so on. That, so it seems possible that skulls and other body parts were circulated within, within, the, within the site. We, of course, don't know really, we can't put the skulls, it would be ideal if we could put the skulls back onto the bodies, and we haven't been able to do that. So, so we don't really know where the skulls came from. So it's possible they're still within these local neighborhoods, but it's also possible that they're, they're, they are circulated uh, within the community more widely, creating these larger connections. Just, just to make it yet more complicated, um, we, we've been trying to work on the genetic affiliations of the people who are buried uh, inside the houses. And one of the problems at Chattelhuyuk is that the bone is preserved really quite badly, and so it's been very, very difficult to get out uh, ancient DNA. But we have been using teeth and the very detailed measurements of human teeth uh, as a proxy for genetic affiliation. So there is some evidence that, that, um, that the very detailed morphology of your teeth uh, is, a genetic, is partly genetically controlled, so that you can use teeth as a sort of proxy measure of genetic distance. And so what's happened here is that Marin Pilu and Clark Larson um, have been taking um, uh, bodies from these houses and looking at their similarity in terms of their, um, th this genetic proxy. And what they find is that, th that it's not the case that people buried in the same house are more genetically closely linked than other people in the community. In fact, there's a total mixing. So, so that very similar people in terms of their genetics are found in widely different houses, buried in widely different <coughs> houses across the settlement. We, we, we do have a new um, uh, project that is working on, on ancient DNA in order to look at this directly from the ancient DNA. And, but, and the first evidence from that supports this idea. The first evidence from the ancient DNA supports the fact that, that people buried in a house are not, are not closely genetically linked. So how do we explain this? And uh, Pilou and Larson argue 
that what's going on here is that uh, after, sometime after birth, uh, children are farmed out through adoption or fostering or some sort of process so, so that children grow up not with their uh, new, you know, genetic parents but with adoptive parents. So, so that uh, the society is one in which children have two types of parents. You have your genetic parents and your adoptive parents. So it all becomes extremely mixed so that you may not even uh, know who your relations are because it all becomes one great family of everybody very tightly mess uh, linked up. But it, but it, it shows again that the, 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 the society at Chattelhuyuk was very, very tightly networked and meshed uh, in, in the various ways I've been describing. So that if you looked at um, Chattelhuyuk uh, at, at the time, uh, one of these time slices, you, you would see all these houses apparently all sort of clustered together, but underlying that there are these very complex uh, social relationships which are creating a very tightly knit uh, society, one in which there are these nested patterns of affiliation and these cross-cutting lines of various sorts that link people together in a very, very tight framework. I, I'm not going to, I want to sort of skip over this because um, time's moving on. But um, wh one other thing to say is that there is a lot of evidence that older people had, had a particular uh, status at Chattelhuyuk. The, these types of images from Chattelhuyuk, we, we are reinterpreting as people, uh, women who are post childbirth, who, who um, are, are, are sort of aged. And uh, th there is lots of evidence from the dietary evidence as, as well that, that people of some age, both men and women, were treated uh, w with some special um, privileges. And so it seems to me that another aspect of the society at Chattelhuyu was that the rules and constraints and orderliness of the society w w were somehow in the hands of elders who, who had a society. Again, I, I want to sort of rush over this, I think, because um, time is running on. Um, but I just want to emphasize that, that there are a lot of ways in which uh, the society at Chattelhuyuk went through changes uh, and in the, in the in internal organization of the site and in terms of the types of burial that were going on, uh, the burial associations. This, this is showing the domestication of cattle through time, the gradual domestication of cattle the gradual transformation in the agricultural system, the gradual environmental change from wetter to drier. So there's a whole series of things that happen through time uh, at Chattelhuyu, uh, and, and that many of the things I'm talking about uh, do actually change towards the end of the occupation. I've mainly been talking about the middle sort of period, but right towards the end of the site, there is some real evidence of something different going on, that is the emergence of very large houses with large amounts of storage and with possible specialization of production. So it's possible that right at the end something else happens, although it quickly dies out by the time one gets to the, the West Man. So there is, there is a, a moment where things change. And one can try to talk about um, this as a, uh, as a process where in the early and middle period there's a, there's a set of processes that occur in this tightly, uh, tightly knit very highly dense community that lead, that, but nevertheless leads to pressure and stress. There's evidence of, of disease and stress on the human bodies. Uh, and that creates some sort of crisis around uh, 6,500 BC that is then relieved in the, in the late occupation by having a society which is more mobile and more dispersed and more, more emphasizing production rather than, rather than uh, ritual. So uh, I just want again to, to thank the team and to the various people that have supported and funded us, some, some of them over 25 years, which is very impressive, uh, and to thank you for listening. Thank you. We do have some time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, thank you. 
I had the opportunity of visiting Chattel Hoik myself a number of years ago and was very impressed by what I saw there. So thank you for your supervising all of this. Uh, several thousand years later, and uh, 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 not that far north, is the Hittite Empire, uh, which is Indo-European in, in language. Do you think this could have been a proto-Indo-European settlement? Yeah, so um, am, am I still working? Can you hear me at the back still? Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so Colin Renfrew, who, who's talked a lot about the spread of Indo-European languages into Europe, he, he, he argues that these were proto-Indo-European speakers. And uh, there have been a number of other people who followed up with that. And it's partly related to the, to, to the, sort of the work on the spread of humans, as, as indicated by ancient DNA. And so, so, of course, ancient DNA doesn't tell us what language people were speaking. But, but there's now strong evidence that the spread of farming um, through Chattelhuyuk and on into Europe uh, w w was a, involved a, a significant migration and movement of people. And so some people argue that, that we could talk about those as Indo-Europeans. There nevertheless are a number of linguists who, who, who protest this and who argue that, that in fact, Indo-European languages spread through Europe later on. And, and there is other types of genetic evidence that are linked to that. So, so it's an open question. I, I would say the predominant view now is that, um, that Indo-European languages spread through Europe later than Chattelhuyu. So we don't know what language they would have spoken. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, the abandoned houses you were talking about uh, earlier in those maps. So where are you speaking? I can't see you. Hi. OK, mm -hmm. sorry, OK. Yeah. The, the abandoned houses you were talking about, um, do you mean to say that they are standing structures that are simply empty and not in use, or have they sort of tumbled down, creating, creating much more of the open space that maybe people were looking for? Yeah. I mean, bear in mind that we're talking about really short time periods. These are just 25 years or so. Um, but uh, yes, we do have a lot of evidence that these va they're vacant lots. So they're not turned into uh, uh, refuse areas, and they're not lived in. But, they, what, but what we see is plaster falling off the wall, or, or, wall, or walls leaning, or, or rat infestations, uh, or mice, sorry, mice infestations, um, or being used as a, a, you know, as a latrine. So, so that, that's what I meant. But if this is new. I didn't realize this until very recently. It's only the dating that has really, because you can't, you know, the dating, the, the Archaeology just shows that something is after the other. It doesn't show you the gaps. And so it's only this dating that's proved, shown that there really are these gaps and that we sort of, it, the, the abandoned lot, the vacant lot, is actually a really important part of the settlement pattern. Hello. Um, could you tell me Can you how identify yourself again? Sir? What? Where you are? Oh. There, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Suzanne Morgan. Um, uh, how was this site uh, selected to research it? Um, it was found by James Mellart in the 50s. And he, do, do you mean why did he excavate it? He, he, excav he excavated it because he wanted to prove that early farming societies uh, occurred in Anatolia not, and not only in the Fertile Crescent. So that was his aim. Uh, but he, he also saw immediately that it was a very special site because he found paintings and things almost immediately. So he, he, he knew he was on to a good thing. And so that's why, why he excavated it. The, the site was then abandoned for about 30 years uh, after he stopped excavating. And the reason I excavated it was because I also knew it was a very amazing site, and it, it would allow me to explore questions that you can't do at most sites, because the preservation here is really remarkable. Those very fine layers, I mean, it's mind-bogglingly um, complex. And so I just wanted to see what we could do. Uh, two quick questions, thank you. Um, do we have evidence that this settlement was part of a larger community, if not 
a proto-kingdom, at least some kind of a broader society. And second, did you have a chance to do, a net, do, an, do an analysis of isotopes in the tooth enamel to determine that the people buried on that site were born and raised right near there or possibly came in from other areas? Yeah, so as far as what, hap what happens in the, in the area around Chattahoo, there have been surveys done. And the, the initial surveys that were done by Douglas Baird argue that uh, when Chattahoo formed, the landscape emptied. So everybody came into Chattahoo. So it sort of acted as a magnet and just drew everybody, pulled everybody in. So you, there are sites in the landscape before Chattahoo, and there are sites in the landscape after Chattahoo. By the time of Chattahoo, everything gets sucked in. So that was the argument. Whether that's true or not, we'll have to see for, as new work gets done. But that was the original claim. And, and on the isotope work, it's, it, that, that's really interesting because we, we assumed that people were traveling all over the place and you know, coming in from a wide variety of, of uh, origins. But the vast number of people at Chattahoo were born and raised on the plain all the way through the sequence. It's not the case that people were marrying in from lots of other, or moving in from wider areas. They're a small percentage, less than 5%. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts on the uh, recent uh, Neolithic site in Israel, and if you think there may be a relationship between that site and the one here at, in Turkey. So wh which site are you talking about in Israel? Um, I'm not sure what it's called. It's a very large Neolithic settlement. They say it's one of the biggest ones I've ever found in, in, in the Levant, so. Yeah, so, so there are, there, there are a, a large number of sites in, in the Levant that are of the same time period or earlier than Chattelhuyu. Uh, and there are lots of similarities in terms of material culture. You know, a lot, a lot of the obsidian points, for example, uh, show, show connections. And, and we know that obsidian was traded over huge distances across the Middle East in, in the Neolithic period. So there were definitely connections, but, but I doubt that much of it was direct. I think it was sort of indirect down the line uh, exchange. So uh, first of all, thank you for a fantastic lecture. Uh, you describe what seems sort of like a lattice work of uh, I, uh, identity group formation where in, in certain respects, depending on what variable you're analyzing, group affiliation might be determined very clustered spatially, depending on diet, for example, and yet there would be at the same time cutting across that group affiliations in other variables, like the decorations and so on. I, I guess I'm curious if you think that that lattice-like nature of group identity formation is unique to Chattelhuyuk, or is this a common sort of feature of human behavior that you've been able to identify at Chattahoyuk because of the fine-grained analyses and multidisciplinary methodological uh, techniques that you employ there? Yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty is that to, find, you know, to find evidence from other sites that, that would allow us to make those parallels. And until other sites have done this type of fine-grained analysis, it's going to be very difficult to see, certainly ethnographically. You know, so for example, th there are societies ethnographically where children are fostered out and don't live with their nuclear family. So that does, d so, you know, there are, so I can show you, and, and, and I've used a lot, you know, ethnographic examples from around the world that show parallels with it. And, and so, so in, yes, I mean, th there are lots of, you know, for, for example, people make parallels with the Pueblos, the Southwest Pueblos, particularly in terms of those sorts of sodalities, the cross-cutting Sodalities. And there are many societies which have some sort of nested lineage system, you know, through time. So I think it fits in um, in an ethnographic sense, but I, th but I think it's very <coughs> different from what we expected. Thank you very much. Um, looking at the uh, skeletons and having analyzed them, what can we say about their general health, life expectancy, and of course whether there is any dietary advice we can derive from those people? Thank you. Um, so, so there's been a huge amount of work done on, um, on the human remains and trying to answer those sorts of questions. 
I, I, I've been surprised to find that there are a good number of people who got to a good old age. I mean, it's difficult to age old people um, on, on the bones, but, um, but they seem to be living up to 67, some people living up to 60, 70. But, but there's, a, there's a very high infant child mortality. So lots and we have lots and lots of, of infants and uh, neonates, people dying off very early. But if you manage to get to, say, 10, you, the, the, these were relatively healthy. It, it, w with, with agricultural societies, health tends to decline. And because uh, people are eating a much narrower diet, you know, carbohydrate-based diet, and so they tend, to, you know, illnesses and other sorts of things tend to develop through time. But at Chattelhuya, that we just have a moment between being healthy hunter-gatherers and really ill farmers, where, where we're a little, where we're a little bit in between, and, and they're, they're still relatively healthy because they're not fully. They're still eating a lot of wild, a very diverse, you know, mosaic of, of, of diets and things. So that's, that's the answer. Eat a, di eat a diverse mosaic of diets, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us both in person and online this evening. Uh, can we show appreciation one more time for our wonderful speaker today? And please join us for a really nice reception in the Mesopotamian Gallery. Thank you again. Jobs will be to get you to the reception, uh -huh. so you're not swamped here. That's my name, my last. <laughs>